So um, we'll go ahead and get started and we're going to have a lot more join. So I'll ask this first couple of minutes, I'll try to um, allow people to have talking privileges, but it is great to see everybody today. Um, this is your chance to get your lawn and garden questions answered by. It's funny that they call us the experts when they sit this out, Dad. I consider you more of the expert. I feel like I just um, have done a pretty good job of just listening over the years, all these questions over and over again. And so I've picked up and I feel like I tend to regurgitate more than actually feeling like I'm an expert with this. So thanks for joining me, Dad. You'll make me look good. I'll give you all the hard all right. questions. <laughs> we're fine, you know, we're, we're all, it's gonna be good. It's a good day and uh, spring is starting, starting down here in South Alabama. And uh, we're looking toward a really exciting year this year. Well, Dad, I also, with this being our webinar, it's, the objective is to answer a lot of questions. So I know in past webinars, we've done a lot of presentations. This one is to answer a lot. So we'll talk a little bit. We've already got some questions coming in. I've got three already. But I do want to tell you a few names I recognize on the list that have logged in. I see Brian. Brian is a Facebook group. He has a lot of followers that is specifically driven around Zoysia. So um, just to kind of let you guys know, Brian is here. He has a Facebook group of with Soysia, so thanks for joining us, Brian. I love following along. I love um, sometimes chatting in. I tend to be quiet and reserved in your Facebook group, but I love that. Thank you. I love um, listening to other what's going on with other people's Zoysia. And we also see some homeowners on the list. Um, thank you for joining us. We've got some attendees here. One thing I kind of want to let everyone know is on Zoom, there is a Q&A button at the top or on your dashboard. If you'd like to answer a question and you don't want to unmute and ask, feel free to just ask that Q&A. Jo is here with us and she will give me the question. I will purposely um, go through them. I give all the hard ones to dad and I'm going to take all the easy ones today. Uh -huh. And <laughs> we want to make this really fun for everybody, interactive. And um, so whatever we can do to help you guys with your lawn and garden, now's your time. Um, just to kind of give you a backstory, Dad, give a backstory and say who you are. Give a little um, history on who you are. All right. I'm George Warner. I was number four of a family of eight children, six boys and two girls. My father was uh, number 10 of 17. And, uh, and then my grandfather was born in New York, went back to Germany, and then came back and married Emma. And she had asthma real bad. So the doctors told them to head south and get in the humidity. And we got in the heat and we got in the humidity and been farming ever since. And uh, that was my, uh, and, and Grandpa Fred's uh, father and mother moved down here. So where I'm, I'm, I'm the fourth generation. Uh, Christina, you're the fifth generation of farmers here and are in the farm families. And uh, now there's a sixth generation populating all over. And in our area, we, we've learned that you don't, you don't talk about several of the big German names that were, uh, this was Bowen County was a immigrant county where people come and, and from all over Europe. And they had large families, and typically you don't talk about none of the big names because somebody somewhere is relative to us. <laughs> but we've been farming and uh, large and produce and turf grass, and uh, you can go to our website at warren.com or Warren Landscapes, and you can learn a lot about our history and uh, the farms in Hawaii and Colorado and, and uh, the southeastern United States. So that's exactly right. So that everyone knows as our attendees, although dad is primarily located in the Southeast, he does farm in Hawaii and Colorado and in the Southeast. So he does have fescue, bluegrass, as well as islands in all different kinds of soil conditions, as well as, I mean, growing up dad, I can remember running through the cornfields. I can remember um, working on the sweet potato shed, and um, so I know you've done broccoli and other different things. So the great thing is, is now is a good time for um, questions concerning lawn, of course, but then also we've already got one question. Here you go, dad, you ready? Um, right. When is the best time to plant tomatoes in the South? So when do you go and put the tomatoes? Well, actually, I have a confession. I have two forms of tomatoes that are sitting in a packet 
that so, hopefully you're going to tell me that it needs to be done this weekend. What's the answer to that? Well, that's a little early yet, but you know, we used to plant first of March and what we would do is we put a little cover around it or around it. So the frost didn't settle in on the plant. Uh, you can plant now if you can protect it from them cold nights or a lot of wind. You need some kind of little protection around it. But you could plant now. I would recommend waiting a, a few weeks. But, you know, I've always found out the real, uh, the people that have it in their blood and in their heart, they have vegetables, they tend to be a week or two before everybody else. Okay. All right. Great. Um Let's go on. Let's see what I've got on the next screen here. Let's see. Okay, so here we are, Dad. Just a little, um, a little fun one. Of course, we already went over this. Dad's been farming for a hundred years. There's Dad on the left side of the screen. There's me on the right side with our ice cream buckets. So after we finished the ice cream, Mom gave us the buckets. That was in the back side of our house there in Alabama. Um, Dad, of course, fourth generation. A little bit of story there. We'll send out this recording to everybody attending. Also, um, here's another little one about Dad. I've spent a lifetime farming and instructing homeowners on how to have a healthy lawn or crop. I found the only way to achieve this is to start with premium crops and healthy soil. Warner Farms produces the highest quality turf grasses in the U.S. And now Soil Kit empowers the homeowner and landscaper with a soil sample that provides accurate and professional scientific results. All right, great. So you gave a little up. Oh, it looks like we've got another question there. Okay, hang on one second. Um, okay, let me get these questions over. They're coming in and I can't see it because we're doing a presentation. So hold tight, Dad. Let me check this for you. All right, here's the questions. Mm -hmm. All right. Juliana says, I have an area in my lawn, mostly shade, that last summer had white, hard fungus growing. It had hard roots that went down below the ground. I tried lots of things, covering with dirt, replanting the grass, vinegar solution, bleach to get rid of it, but was not successful. I am located in Wisconsin, so I'm curious if it ha will have died over the winter. If it hasn't and comes back, do you have any ideas of what might it be and how to get rid of it? Well, uh, a mushroom is a fungus and typically use some kind of a herbicide. I would think that uh, the vinegar or maybe the, uh, if you had a, a real blend, I don't know if you could use a bleach of some sort, but it'd be extremely diluted down but you use a fungicide for uh, those uh, mushrooms. And in Wisconsin, I would think that, yes, it'll very likely come back next year because fungus typically leaves their, uh, uh, they, they drop their, fun, you know, their seeds there by the, by the plant. Now, I would think that that fungus, if I'm, if I'm right, is probably tapped into a root of one of your trees. And typically it's from a root that's beginning to decay. There's a symbiotic relationship between that mushroom, very likely, and that root. And, and they are using each other to, uh, in, in a natural sense. But I, I, I think it's a good chance that that fungus is probably attached to the tree root. Hi, this is Juliana. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. yes, I can hear you. Hi, sorry. So I thought it was a mushroom too. However, it was really, really hard. And like with a shovel, it was even hard to get out of the ground. But you're probably right. There's a huge maple tree that's very close to where that was. Um, can I send that area of soil in to get tested? And would that tell me anything? Well, the, well I'll, I'll speak on this part, Dad, since we're talking about soil. So we do not test for fungicides or diseases. What we test for is if there's a pH difference, of course, like the different nutrients, let's say you're extremely deficient in phosphorus, potassium, things that are in root health and pH, it makes you susceptible to these. So my job on the soil kit side of it is we put all the nutrients up to nice and healthy. So quote, when the flu hits or any of the sicknesses hit, you've got basically all kinds of protection to do that. So as for can we diagnose a certain disease, Soil kit does not do that on a soil sample. However, we can help you with nutrients that are tied to making it susceptible to diseases. Okay, what thank you. What could be is if you get a picture of it 
and send sure. it to us. We'll do some research on it and see if we can help you find a solution to it. Okay, thank you very much. Yes. And the address to send that to, send it to info at soilkit.com and I'll get that circulating. Okay. And now I will say one of my, I'm not sure what you use for a fun, uh, fungus, but I will say that I've used heritage before. I don't make any money on this. So it's just, just my um, discussion on this. I have used heritage before and I have a lot of people with success with heritage. So not sure if you've used that product at all. I have not. Thank you for the suggestion. I would, yeah. I, I would first identify exactly what it is. And then I would, uh, just like your soil test, you want to identify exactly what's missing and, and with this here, uh, possible fungus or something else, a picture, identify it, then you, you, you deal with it directly, just that uh, plant. Okay, I appreciate it, thank you. Right. Okay, Dad, we have another question from Joe. How do I keep my ferns from dying and having to buy a new one every year? Uh, I would assume that you're living in the south or where it doesn't freeze too hard. Some ferns will freeze uh, in the winter. I noticed uh, yesterday I pulled up to an office complex and the ferns had just been completely burned to the ground from cold. Uh, ferns are usually perennial. They'll, they'll keep living if they, can, if they can stay in their natural habitat but sometimes wintertime will take them out. One of the things about ferns, they just get, if you have them in a basket or in the soil, they get thicker and thicker. And what I found is, is people will take and uh, cut the ferns in half or cut them and break them apart and put them back in the pot again and let them regrow again. Because a lot of it is it, just getting too compacted in that container. If it's in a container now, if it's out there in the, in the, in the open environment, then it could be a weather event taking place or something else. Okay, we have a question from Steven. Now this one was actually from um, something we are currently doing from a prior webinar that I do wanna to add to this one because we get this one all the time. When is the good time to top dress by Bermuda and with what? And so I did a quick little analysis, uh, Dad, with Alan about this. And the answer to that question is when to do it. Alan likes to do it in July and August when the Bermuda is just very much raging growing. And then of course he likes to use the white sand. So we get that question all the time. And um, that's that. Let's see. One My comment would be you can do it anytime. Right now is good. I would be careful not to put uh, an inch or more but I would use maybe a half. If you go to the golf courses, you'll see them sanding their grains and stuff. And that's always a good time. But I think it's probably any time, but it's probably better that your grass is growing. It's in a growing mode. So it would probably be as soon as it warms up. Okay, all right. I would use white wash sand, the same thing that the concrete people use to mix in concrete. It just, it's mined out of the way. There's no other amendments or no other uh, weed contamination in this white sand. And, and it really does wonders for your lawn. Okay. Okay, so we have another question from Karen. Karen is in the Oregon, okay, I'll read it to you. Sorry, I need readers and I'm refusing to go get them. I am here in Oregon in the Valley. My grass is not doing well and has moss and dead grass mixed into the grass. I have a lawn service and they mow nearly every week. And I was wondering if this would cause any problems or if you have any idea that would cause this. Okay, dad, I'll let you jump in since you are the grass guy, but I am gonna reference Miss Karen that we definitely need to start with a soil sample because moss kind of signif signifies two different things. Number one, that it's really wet but also number two, that there may be an incredibly low pH issue going on too. So with you saying that there's moss, I would definitely like, that's a, usually kind of an airflow wet, but at the same time could be a pH issue. So let's number one, start there. And um, dad, can the lawn service have caused this? Well, if it was a fungus, maybe could, they could have- I would think the first thing I would ask is, is how much water are you putting? Is, are you watering your lawn every day? I know that valley is some of the most, the richest land almost in America. It's just that valley there in Oregon is incredibly 
good land. And uh, I would be wanting to know if, uh, if you're putting too much water out. That would be my first question. And I would recommend that it dries up a little bit. You, you need your lawn to dry out. I mean, it's, it's like a little child trying to learn how to walk. They need to strain every now and then. What it does is shoots roots down. It gives you a healthier lawn. And I would start with water. And like Christina said, uh, a soil test. But the moss, I'd want to also get a picture of that so we can really identify it and we could help you tell you what, what to do. So Ms. Karen, I know that um, you're unmuted, so feel free to chime in. I know that dad recommends, um, he tries to keep everybody to watering twice a week in the morning only. His whole philosophy is deeper and less frequent than more frequent waterings at less amount, as well as never do it in the afternoon either. So dad is a big believer in that, try to keep it to two times a week if possible and just do it deeper. And never mow it wet. Don't mow your lawn in the morning. Mow it in the afternoon. It should be. And then overwatering nationwide is the number one issue that affects lawns. I mean, that or too much shade. But water is always, it's everybody thinks they got to water, water, water. No, we get down. It really loves drying out. But it loves, it loves moisture, but it loves to dry out. Yes, I agree. I agree. Okay. Um, another question here. We and we went over this also. We keep getting this. Um, I'm planting blueberries and my pH is a 7.6. What is your favorite product? I'll tell you this. Blueberries love a 4.5 to 5. I get a lot of blueberries. Um, it, there must be a lot of people who like hydrangeas, azaleas, and blueberries. They like that real sweet pH, that real 4.5 to 5. And um, we, I personally, again, I'm not, you know, as fertilizer sales rep, so I say this honestly. I love the Espoma acidifier. It's got a little blue hydrangea on it. You can find it in all different places. It's the perfect product. One thing we want to reiterate, anytime you're raising a pH, real easy, lime, not too much harm there. I, I never really have any issue with raising pHs with air, but however, when you're doing sulfur and you're bringing things down, there can be burning and things can get very aggressive. So make sure to read the back of the product label. More is not always better. So make sure that you follow the product label, you do what it says, and then at least wait 60 to 90 days before you do that again. We recommend doing another soil sample in six months just because we are pulling the pH down. So just to kind of be aware. Um, and of course, the USDA recommends everyone does a soil sample once a year. So, but when you're pulling that pH, pH down, you've got a specialty crop like blueberry because you want it to be a really sweet taste. Try to do a, a soil sample at six months to see what that looks one, like. One thing also, Christina, uh, if they're watering the blueberries, Yes. You need to make sure a lot of times when you have a high alkaline soil like that, your water is very likely alkaline and you may be compounding it as, as you're trying to fix it if your water is, has a real high pH. And so yeah. you want to you wanna be able to put some kind of filter system in or something that you can uh, put some things in there to where it would bring the pH down because Sometimes you're counterbalancing, everything's tied together. All your water, your soil, everything is tied together and gets into this vicious circle. Yeah, you're exactly right. Okay, let's move on. So that goes into soil kit. So that's what the um, that's what I'm currently working on at the project. And it is a fully automated lab-based soil test kit and technology platform. We provide clients with an incredibly easy to use soil collection and registration process. Easy to understand results include specific products and quantity recommendations. So what we do is we basically help the homeowner identify how many square feet they have. We help them also align to a crop. The exciting part of this is dad does soil samples on his zoysia farm as well as fescue and uh, bluegrass and centipede and all the other grass varieties. But Soil Kit has a special proprietary crop code. We are not a producer. We are a homeowner. We are a maintenance level. We have our own proprietary codes. So um, I'm allowing people to talk. 
as they're coming in. They're joining us a little bit late today, Dad. Um, but thanks for joining us, guys. I appreciate it. I know everybody's busy today. But feel free, the new ones that have just joined in, there is a chat at the top. Just go hit that chat box if you don't want to speak in front of anyone. Feel free to just go chat these questions. Great. I see them coming in right now. We've had another one. And um, keep those comments coming in. And Joe's helping uh, send those over to me. Just a quick slide on soil kit, just to kind of give you what it is. On this one right here, that's what it looks like. We have now increased our, um, our testing capabilities. This is for sale at soilkit.com, $29.95. This is without the trowel. We test for the pH. We test for the phosphorus, potassium, magnesium, calcium, manganese, iron, copper, boron. What's exciting though is now we are also letting the consumers know the buffer pH, the CEC, which is cation exchange capacity, and the organic matter. You can see here you have the brown sample bag. You have the self-addressed and postage paid um, envelope, as well as you get the scientific results and you also have a customer care card. Okay, Ms. Karen, how do I do the soil test from the grass? Do I need to dig in several spots and down past the roots? Or, you know what, Ms. Karen, I have some slides. How about this? Let me go to the slide for you. I wanna watch this quick video for you to explain what to do. Before I talk to the video, let you watch it. When it comes to grass, the grass roots are at two to four inches, okay? That is the part of the soil where they are taking in the nutrients is that two to four level, okay? So that's where I want you to be is where the nutrients are going into the roots to be uptake. So I need four well-represented areas and let's take a look real quick and we'll look at this video and it will explain everything you need to know. While some soil kit packages come with a trowel, all soil kits come with a sample bag, prepaid mailing envelope, customer care card, and instructions. Whether you obtain your soil kit from an online source or one of our retailers or landscape partners, testing always starts with registration which connects your soil sample and test results to you and your email address. To register, visit soilkit.com backslash register. Enter your email address and name and the kit ID found on your sample bag. You can also scan the QR code using your mobile device. Next, identify your sample location by entering your address or using our geolocation technology. You can add a description such as front yard, or backwoods food plot when submitting multiple samples. Next, enter the size in square feet of the area your soil sample represents so we can accurately calculate fertilizer application rates. If you aren't sure, use our satellite guided sizing tool. In most cases, we recommend one kit for every 10,000 square feet. After that, choose the type of crop or grass you are cultivating and confirm your registration. Now it's time to take your soil sample. Be sure to use a stainless steel or plastic trowel to avoid metal contamination. If your soil has been recently fertilized, you'll need to wait for two weeks before sampling. In choosing four sample locations, try to evenly distribute them across the sample area and avoid wet spots. Collect two scoops of soil at each location, two to four inches from the soil surface. Ensure the dirt has reached close to, but not beyond the fill line. Seal the sample bag by bending the tabs. We recommend you write your name on the sample bag. Then put your sample bag into the prepaid mailing envelope. Seal the envelope and send. Be sure to keep your customer care card as it includes your kit ID number for reference. Within 36 hours of receipt, our certified lab team will calculate your soil amendment needs and send you an email with a link to your test results. The view my results I just ended it. I apologize. Sorry about that. Well, I went over those instructions for you guys and we'll send out the video. We have a lot of questions coming in. So actually ending that video a little premature is great because we have a lot coming in. And for all those that are new, just to reiterate, there's a Q&A at the top. Feel free to put your questions there. It will, um, we'll answer them aloud. But here's some we have already coming in. Um, okay, so let's see, Brian. As like the other person, I have some moss growing in a spot where the dormant grass is thin. My pH was 6.5 this year. And Brian, I'm assuming because I know, I believe I know who you are, was it Zoysia? And if you're unmuted, feel free to chime in. What is the best way to get rid of the moss 
to make sure it doesn't spread or stick around this summer and spring. Dad, what's the best way for Brian to- Oh, um, I, I would think that uh, he need, it would be great if he took and sanded that zoysia. And if he took a, a half inch or so of sand and put across that, if it's zoysia, but if it's, uh, if he's further north, he may be beyond the transitional zone where it's uh, bluegrass or other type grasses then. But the sanding would be the first thing. If your pH is six and a half, the second is, is how much water are you getting? Are you getting a lot of shade? You're saying it's thinning out. If the grass is thinning out, there's a reason for it. It could be too much shade. And what? And remember with zoysia, it is a really, really good product. It likes moisture, but it doesn't, what they call it, they don't like what they say in agriculture is you don't want your feet to remain wet. An orange grove loves water, but it likes his feet to get dry. Zoysia, if it is zoysia, and this moss, in my opinion, it, uh, that sand is going to help. Uh, the second thing is, is do you have a drainage problem? Is there water pocketing? Great. Hey, okay. yeah, th this is Brian. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, it is, it is for zoysia, and um, it has been really wet here in central Virginia, and we have clay. So it never dries out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If you could sand this year. dress it with some sand, I think what you're going to do, you'll end up doing is you'll begin to build a profile of allowing it to drain. I've seen some uh, sports fields that were built up in the heart of uh, the real thick clay soils, abalone or, or even mountain type uh, clays. <clears throat> and what happens is, it, it's penetration is terrible. It, the, the, the percolation rate real low. And if you'll continue to oversee, over sand it, put some sand on it. After a few years, that sand profile will help it drain. But making sure that the water doesn't sit on it. You know, anytime you have moss and thinning out, it's either trees or too much water. Great. And I see some people are unmuting themselves to talk. So just want to kind of provide just a quick moment. If anybody wants to chime in and ask a question before I go on to the next topic, feel free to do so. Okay, perfect. All right, dad, what else would you like? Let's go back to our couple topics that we have here. Well, let me and talk to Brian just a little bit about Zoysia. Sure. About about 25 years ago, there was a big article, I don't know if it's in the Wall Street Journal or one of the other places, and it talked about the future of zoysia. Well, the future is here, and it has, uh, zoysia is becoming a very dominant lawn grass. It has less problems, but remember, there's a few things you need to know about zoysia. One is that it doesn't like too much water. You got to have it, if you have heavier soil or harder, clay soils, make sure it slopes and allows it to get off. And then when you water it, always water it deep. Don't water it every day. Zoysia likes to dry out. But I mean, you know, there's some zoysias that if it gets real dry, it'll go dormant. It doesn't die, it'll turn brown. It just goes dormant. And when you put water back on, it comes back. But if you'll allow your zoysia to stress a little bit, it will shoot its roots deeper and it will pull out more nutrients that may be lacking in the top half inch. So dad, I know Brian. Brian, do you wanna give a quick um, discussion on your Facebook group that you have for zoysia lovers? I think we may have lost Brian, dad. So, oh, okay. Yeah, okay. sorry. Sorry, he maybe doesn't. My, maybe my conversation ran him off. You know? No, uh, <laughs> no, it may have put him to sleep. No, I'm just kidding, Dad. I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, Brian, um, I get to follow different groups along, and I've recognized his name as well as on the registration. Um, Brian is uh, has a large Facebook following of his group that people get to just ask organic questions about uh, zoysia, and so I get to listen here and there as they do that. Um, Okay, 
So let's see. Does anybody else have any questions? I'll go back to that picture with the grass right there. Which the, one? This one? Yeah, and, that uh, one right there. Now, if you look, there's a couple of things. It, it, when you have your zoysias, if it's a sandier type soil, it will create more stolons in the ground. So does that go with Bermuda? And some, num some bluegrass now uh, varieties have stolons in them. And that uh, little sand profile on there allows it to put more stolons in. And your stolons are your uh, food storage source. They, you, the leaves and or the chlorophyll, it will store carbohydrates in the stolons. And when, when your lawn goes through a stress, the carbohydrates in the stolons is what kick, brings it back out. And that was the, that's a field that was on grown real sandy soil. Go ahead. Okay. We've got another question for you, Dad. When is the best time of year to kill weeds? I have heard that colder weather is better. And these weeds, I almost knew the answer, but these weeds are in my garden beds. Uh, there's two times a year you, you, you need to get them is when they come up. And usually in the fall, you'll have your winter type weeds that, that sprout and grow up in the cool season. Uh, if you're in the southeast or someplace you may be under snow, and then in the spring, and your first week or two, when they first come up, we used to raise a lot of soybeans and watermelons long before there was herbicides and things. And the way we started out farming is we had a hoe. And uh, my dad had eight children, and needless to say, uh, we had work to do. And uh, we, after the beans were planted and cultivated once, Everything after that, you, you had to hoe the weeds out. And the sooner you get them hoed out, the better. So that leads us to discussion. I just, um, I was a part of an interview yesterday, just listening in, where um, Camille was interviewing Alan all about pre-emergence and the importance of trying to, when it comes to lawns, doing your pre-emergent this type of year so that you're preventing the weeds. We all hate the stickers. We all hate the weeds. And um, in the importance of how Alan was explaining the pre-emergence where now I know in the Southeast, some, some people all over the country, they're still under snow. But when that snow is melting, you wanna get before that weed really gets to be a post-emergent problem. So right now, kind of, let's see dad, how far are you going up right now? Tennessee, kind of through Texas and all the way down through Florida. Are you going up in North Carolina area? Everybody's putting pre-emergence down this week and last week, aren't they? Now yeah. I know that was On your lawns though, that'd be your lawns, but your garden, typically you're not gonna do a whole lot of herbiciding there because every vegetable, you know, you put out the wrong herbicide, then you're limited on two or three vegetables and not the rest. So you know, the garden is where you're going to work for them, but your lawn right now is the time to begin the consideration. Uh, your soil temperatures are still in 60 below, but once you get in the high 60s, your, your weed seeds going to start germinating. Yeah, I think kind of rule of thumb is 65 degrees, right, for soil temperatures when I that. Think so. Right now, you probably need, you know, it'll start moving north, but I would say from now to from here to Birmingham. Uh, if you're in South Florida, it's already, uh, you're probably already about late. But now we've got Miss Karen in Oregon. So what do you think her timing is going to be like? When does that soil up there reach 65 degrees? I think they would probably be better at answering that. I don't know how cold <laughs> it's there in that valley. I know that you watch the farmers whenever they begin to plant the field corn. Typically when corn starts going in the ground, that's the time of the year that weed seed will start to germinate. Okay. Yes, yeah, she had written a further note after her question that said, it is incredibly wet here, especially this year. And then said, we only water in the summers. So yes. Yeah. So, And for all of those still joining in, feel free to do a Q&A. If you're new, there's a little button on the dashboard. We have a little Q&A. Feel free if you're not comfortable with unmuting yourself to chime in and ask a question, feel free to do that. But if not, just text that in. Miss Joe is reading me the questions as they come in. So feel free to do that. Great. Okay, so let's um, look over a couple different things, Dad, real quick. Um, so what would you be doing besides basically give everybody a, how do I get my grass spring ready right now? 
Uh, it's, it's always, if you're in the southern grasses, it's probably time to start putting your herbicides out. And you need to get a soil test to find out what you're gonna put out. And let me say this about uh, uh, cost this year, fertilizers for your lawn. Uh, phosphates have tripled in cost in the last few months. Fuel's going up now for the last seven weeks, every week. Fuel, fertilizer is extremely tied and, 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 and your lawn is gonna be tied to fuel and your costs are going up fast. And what you want to do is you want to put out what's right. And I always say le le less is best. And that is that you, re farmers now are just getting more precise on exactly what they put out because you don't want to waste any of your, your resources and money on, on something that's, gonna, that's not needed. And uh, the lawn care industry is just now really catching on. And I think in the next 10 years, you'll see that this is adopted nationwide. Almost every lawn homeowner that wants to take care of their lawn uh, before they go out and spend a lot of money on fertilizer. I mean, and, and if I was a landscaper right now, I'd probably go out and buy my fertilizer right now, Wallace, uh, because when that replacement fertilizer comes in stores, it's going to be a lot more expensive. So you don't want to waste resources. And that's where you get your runoff and your environmental issues that continue on a large scale in a big uh, metropolis of people and houses. You know, a little here, a little there, it adds up to be a lot when there's a lot of water and rain. It runs off into your creeks and streams. And uh, this is an environment that we all have to live in. We're all wanting to be good stewards of it. And uh, really, what what what's really needed? Don't don't put out things that are not needed. You want a healthy lawn. You don't want the darkest green growing like crazy because of thatch and your ends, blights. Everything can go wrong. A healthy lawn is a strong health. It, it's it's more tolerant to drought. It's more tolerant to insects. It's more tolerant to uh, diseases. I mean, it's just. It's in a healthier state when you put out what's needed and not not just randomly. So I think you're right on that topic, Dad. So when I was at a trade show in Chicago, a lady came by the front of the booth and she said, well, I've just quit doing fertilizer altogether because it's bad. And I said, OK, I'm sorry, I'm going to need to ask you not to eat anymore either. Fertilizer is not bad. It's the misuse and abuse of it versus knowing how to use fertilizer correctly. Plants need food, they need sunlight, they need water. And that's why it's even important that when you're talking about turf grass and you cut off that top third of the blade, if you're not dealing with massive thatch issues, let that blade go back down, let it decompose, let those nutrients go back in and nourish it and feed the grass back over again and recompose back. And, you know, I kind of went into the importance that the plant needs food in different forms so and going back to that being able to put down the right form of fertilizer because because of the 13 states that go down the mississippi river we've now had the largest dead zone in the gulf of mexico we've ever had in history so just being an environmental steward to say okay, let me do a soil sample. What does the soil need nutrient-wise for the plants I'm starting to grow? And then be able to provide that rather than just going in blindly and saying, I'm just going to buy 13, 13, 13, because that's what I've always done. That's what I'm going to do. That's not the answer anymore. We need to not only be worried about what are the current soil conditions, what does the plant need? And then let's do it at the right amount that we're not running off into the waterways. So, oh, hang on a second now. We've got more questions. Hold on, let me go back real quick and try to get back at those questions. Let's see. Um, let's see. I'm having a quick little error. Let's see if I can get these questions over here, Dad, for you. Hold on one second. It's something about a hibiscus, and I'll get this for you. Let's see. Uh, hibiscus. Uh, hibiscus, yes. Uh, let's see. Okay, here we go. All right, we have got my hibiscus looks like it may not have survived this last freeze. Should I dig it all up and start over or should I just cut it down to the roots? 
I would probably trim it back. Uh, but I would uh, I would wait a few weeks to make sure. What you'll determine is what's alive, what's not. And uh, if you start seeing some regrowth, you'll know that the main stump is alive and you're gonna wanna cut the dead wood off. It's, it's like a vineyard or anything. You remove the dead wood. And I would, I would think that it's very likely you're gonna have to trim it back. If it's dead down into the stump, then I would replace it. Okay. All right, we're closing in at about 1.45, Dad, and I promise we'd be wrapped by two. So we're just gonna take a couple more questions. So for everyone attending, feel free to throw in a couple last Q&A questions and we'll get to them. Um, but here you go, Dad. What is the best way to keep the birds and other critters out of my vegetables and fruits? The netting has not worked in the past and is a pain to deal with. Uh, no, I don't. Well, I mean, what kind of birds? Is it blackbirds or is it other? Uh, you know, nature is... I personally put up a lot of birdhouses for purple martins and stuff because I just love them there. But, you know, and, and out in the field, the birds will come hard. They'll come dig your corn up as soon as it germinates. They'll come pluck it out, the blackbirds and things. Uh, man, I don't know. I I know that they hate if you have a, a dog around, but the, then the dog or cat, you know, they're going to scratch your garden up. So <laughs> uh, I don't know why I would... What you do for a crow, a crow is an extremely intelligent individual. If you can find a dead crow, you hang the dead crow up there. You know? <laughs> Who wants that though? I, I, you know, I don't know how bad the birds are, what are, what they're getting, but it's probably blue jays or something in there. And uh, just, I would feed them probably away from there, and so they might leave the garden alone. I don't know. Oh, right a now, lot of people. A lot of people use pine straw and different things around. So as it germinates, they start putting mulch around it. I, I don't know. Well, right now I'm picturing going out to the farm and, you know, we, my kids and I just planted blueberry bushes and stuff. I can only imagine what would happen if we rolled up at the farm and I, the kids saw a dead crow hanging upside down at the garden. What they would I, 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 I was just <laughs> that out. But crows are so intelligent and they just infuriate me when they come in, they rob the nest is little bitty birds that are trying to live and a crow comes in and gets them and it just, you know, some just don't seem right about all that. <laughs> okay, we got another question and I'm actually gonna answer this because I'm the one that said it. Um, 13, 13, 13 is what I said. And basically 13, 13, 13 is, um, what is the standard quote, all purpose fertilizer. You'll go and you'll see 10, 10, 10. It's the three numbers on a fertilizer bag nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And I always say 10, 10, 10, or 13, 13, 13, meaning 13% nitrogen, 13% phosphorus, and 13% potassium. That's what's in the bag, the percentages of it. The reason you don't want to throw that out is, is because simply if you have a phosphorus toxicity. So we have now at Soil Kit developed a threshold of phosphorus. So here's what happens in, in the phosphorus when you get a soil report with Soil Kit. You have zero to a certain amount of pounds, that's a deficiency. So you are given the deficiency recommendation that basically you're thirsty for phosphorus. You get that recommendation. Then there's a small little threshold that we call a maintenance level where you have an okay amount of phosphorus, but we're gonna give you a maintenance level because we know you're gonna plant a garden or you know the grass is gonna need some phosphorus. So we have a maintenance level here. But when you reach about, uh, some have a discrepancy between four to 600 pounds per acre of phosphorus. If you go and plant something, the phosphorus is actually burning the roots. It's actually making it a subprime quality. It is actually harming the phosphorus, what you think is good. And you want phosphorus and plants need phosphorus. Your soils already have it there. Our job at Soil Kit is to utilize what is there or make it available. So let's say the pH is too low or too high and that phosphorus is just not available. We adjust something else. And like dad said, there is a global shortage of phosphorus. So when you have lime at $4 a bag, $5 a bag, and you've got phosphorus that's kind of becoming a limited quantity, as well as it's harmful to the environment, it's more important that we identify exactly the nutrients that your soil needs versus just blindly putting all of the nutrients out because you figure to yourself, 
I'll just put it all out. That way it's there if they need it. That actually can literally in turn burn the roots of the plant. So that's why we find it so important that we really get diagnostic with the soil health and conditions and what the crop species needs rather than just going out and throwing a bag of fertilizer out. As a rule, Christina, phosphate is the center number, the one in the center. Yes. It's yes. 13, 13, 13, the center one is phosphate. It will only move about an inch per year yep. in the soil profile, where the first number and the last number, nitrogen and potassium, they tend to leach down further. So what happens is, is this phosphate continues to build up. And when it builds up, everything gets out of balance. It's, it's, all, it's, it's, it's not good for the environment when it's out of balance. Every, all of these things are critical to the health of the plant and even to our own bodies. We, we draw in our nutrients from the soil through the plants and that's the best form of all your minor elements, your vitamins, everything. It comes really right out of the plants. And the farmers try to keep all that in balance in the soil. So if it's a head of cabbage, Typically, it, it consumes a lot more calcium and magnesium. Potatoes, a red potato or a table potato, it's going to have, it's going to need more phosphorus. So you're going to get your phosphorus from that crop. And then your bananas, you're going to get your potassium from that. And so each crop has its special needs. And that's how we, as we eat these things, they become part of our balanced nutrition. So if you look at it from a balanced nutrition for the farm and for the vegetables and for the food we eat, your lawn is exactly the same way. It's you want a balance out there. So your lawn is just like that. We're, we're living off the vegetables and everything. It's living off the nutrients in the soil. You just don't want it out of balance. So also I have a blog article that I'm about to post. It's about too high and too low of phosphorus. And just so you know, when you have to, not only does it burn the actual plant and the roots, too much phosphorus and the plant begins to burn, just like I said. And it causes, just like that said, it causes other problems. It causes other deficiencies, such as the iron and the, and the zinc, simply because they become trapped and unusable. Usable. So it kind of goes back into too much of a good thing can be a bad thing, which is why yeah. it's so important to do exactly what the plant needs. But, um, well, we're starting to wrap up, Dad, and I right. think you did a halfway good job. You didn't move your chair. I didn't hear a bunch of... Well, I'm just going from sideways, sideways set up with that. <laughs> I did hear some emails going in, so I still have to, like, tell you, we've got to, um, we've got to help you get all nice and silent between, but you've done three webinars this week, and I'm oh, proud of you. You've done a great job, Thank and you. I want to encourage everyone on this um, webinar Number one, to go visit warner.com or warnerlandscape.com. That's dad. That's what he is. And find out more about the Warner family and all of the turf grasses and varieties. But also go to soilkit.com. We encourage you to um, utilize, I can tell you, if you want to use the promo code LEARN, L-E-A-R-N, all caps in the number one, you can get $5 off of a soil kit but also follow our blog. It's really important to follow the blog because we have content that we post, like we're about to post about high phosphorus. Um, we would love also info at soilkit.com if you'd like to email us anything. If you'd like to provide a content suggestion of something you wanna hear us talk about. Let's say you want us to hear us talk about moss. This whole topic of moss has now come up twice mm -hmm. with all of these attendees. I think that's a great article for us to write. So if you'd like for us to talk about any particular content, we love listening to our feedback of our viewers. We love writing about it. So make sure to follow the blog. Before I let them go, Dad, do you have anything else you want yes, to tell I think that uh, there's another upcoming blog with my son, Alan, and y'all are going to be talking about herbicides. Pre-emergent. Oh, I, I, pre so they yeah. know, you know, there's so many new opportunities in herbicides. I, I don't know them all like you and Alan are going to know. And so that's going to be a really good uh, upcoming uh, blog coming up. Remember, yeah. folks, too much water is not good. Thank you. <laughs> and, Dad, there's actually two articles. Uh, Alan did a discussion on the power of dormant grass. A lot of people think they can't lay new sod down or do anything with dormant grass. 
but uh, he was interviewed about just the power of dormant grass of how much is going on right now when you think it's sleeping, uh, just all of the re regeneration and other things going on. So there's quite a few blog articles that Alan's gonna be um, interviewed for, but agree with you, sun and fertilizer, soil conditions and water. Too much water is definitely something out there um, that homeowners are doing a lot there. But uh, anyway, guys, we appreciate you guys attending today. Thank you so much. We appreciate um, you asking all these interactive questions. Should you continue? What we have is we have people email before and after. Questions, feel free to email those to us, and we'll be sending out a recording of this webinar. But thank you so much. We appreciate it today, guys. All right. Thank you. Y'all have a good day.